My name is Ronald van Nooyen of Delft University, and I'd like to talk on the ex estimates of extremes in the best of all possible worlds. And this was work done together with my colleague Ala Kalechkina of Delft University. Now, there are two main parts to my talk. First, prediction in hydrology. Can it be done? And how to see what happens if we do? Second part is mathematically, what kind of indicators of uncertainty do we have once we do this? So I will formalize the problem, do a numerical experiment, and then give both a Bayesian and a frequentist way of looking at uncertainty in the result. Now, prediction in hydrology. question is, can it be done? Well, th there are several good reasons why you shouldn't try. And if you want to know a very long list of those reasons, there are papers on tall tales of on tales of distributions in hydrology by Mr. Clemens, who was not all too happy about this kind of thing. Well, there there already was one talk in this session where it was shown that systems are not stationary, which is one reason why you might be hesitant about doing predictions in hydrology. And the same talk and the following talks mentions about time series are not generated by independent, identically distributed random variables, and we never have enough data. So we have got plenty of good reasons not to try to predict things from hydrological time series. However, other people are not at all hesitant about trying to predict things. They do it in econometrics, in actuarial science, and in medicine, and those are well-respected fields, and when you look at actuarial science and medicine, they're also quite successful. I, at the moment, I don't know whether econometrics is very successful considering current world economics. Uh, and there are also good mathematical reasons why it might be done. For instance, okay, time series are not non-stationary, but we've already had a presentation that gives one way of dealing with it, there are also many mathematical papers dealing with non-stationarity in time series. And, okay, the series might not be independent, it might not even be a series of identical distributions, but again, there is mathematical theory to deal with that. And finally, even if you have long-range correlation, there is mathematical theory that, will, that under certain conditions says, well, don't worry, even with long-range correlation, there's still the theory of extreme values. So, now, as I said, I'm going to look at the best of all possible worlds. So I'm going to assume that I can do statistics on hydrological time series. I'm even going to assume, for the moment, to keep mathematics and conditionals to a minimum, that I live in a world where all my hydrological time series are independently identically distributed. So, what kind of ways do I have to look at my uncertainty? Well, I can do a numerical experiment. I can just generate a lot of short time series and try to derive information from those. And I can say, well, what's the information I really want to know about that time series? Well, in general, that's a quantile. I want to know where the quantiles of my time series are. So suppose in, instead of first finding the parameters and then looking at the quantile for the parameters, suppose I, I look directly at the quantile as a statistic. Now I can do that in a frequentist way or I can do it in a Bayesian way, but I can do it. So let's first see how bad things are by doing a numerical experiment. Now before I do that, I need one slide of formulas to be able to formulate what the problem actually is in a statistical, from a statistical point of view. So, I need one random variable. That's my event, the flood, the drought, the peak rainfall. Okay, that's the random variable capital X. I need a random vector, capital Y, little vector sign above it. That's my uh, sample from my distribution. That's what I'm going to use to uh, dedu deduce information about the random variable x from. 
and I'm going to denote the probability density function by uh, lowercase f, cumulative distribution function by uppercase f, and very importantly, of course, because I'm saying I want to look at quantiles, I'm going to take capital Q, subscript x, as the quantile of my distribution, quantile function of my distribution. So that's more or less the inverse of the cumulative distribution function. Now, it's very, it's, it's uh, interesting if you look at the mathematics because all these functions are parameter dependent. Now, for a known parameter, life is very easy. The probability that my random variable falls to the left of a certain quantile defined as the quantile for probability P0 is equal to the cumulative density function applied to the quantile function of P0, which is P0 itself. Nothing could be simpler. However, if we start to estimate the parameters, then in general that will no longer hold. I will have a question about the probability of the random variable being smaller than the quantile based on the estimate for the case that the parameter has the value T0. Now that's not going to be P0. I, I can be fairly certain of that. So this is probably the only technical mathematical point that's really important here. My quantile function is no longer a quantile function as soon as I plug in estimated parameters. So what can I do instead? Well, I'm first I'll do the experiment to see how bad things are, and then I'm going to look at both a frequentist and Bayesian way of directly estimating the quantile, and I'll see what, whether that will give me uh, something that comes close to the real uncertainty. Now I'm going to use Gumbel because uh, if I use uh, the extreme value distribution with uh, the exponential tail, well, we all know that things are going to be pretty grim if I'm starting to estimate quantiles in the tail. So this is a double exponential, and I'm going to do my numerical experiment. So I'm going to take 10,000 20 point samples from my Gumbel distribution. I first fitted my Gumbel distribution to the long range, the long time series of Nile data, which I happen to have available in uh, the programming language R, which I was using. And so I took 10,000 samples and I get uh, 10,000 parameters. From the 10,000 parameters, I get 10,000 quantiles. So I looked at the 99% point of my distribution. So the, the point where I say, okay, that's my once in 100 year flood. That's the red line. According to the true value of the parameters. Now around that, the black line is the distribution of my quantiles estimated from the parameters that I got from the samples. As you can see, uh, it could be anywhere from 1250 to about 2000 cubic meters per second. And this is because I took my sample size to be 20. Now this is uh, quite shocking. I don't think the typical manager would be very happy with this result, but it's the truth. There's nothing we can do about this. So can we get an indication of that uncertainty without doing the experiment for which we need two parameters? Well, in the Bayesian approach, that's the formula is very simple. You say, okay, I generate my posterior distribution of the parameters, I plug that into the quantile, and I can get a probability. And interestingly, interestingly enough, sometimes that actually coincides with the frequentist way of doing things, which I will do here because the... Bayesian way is quite hard because you need the posterior density. So, frequentist approach. The, the naive way would be to say, okay, I take uh, BUB, dependent on the quantile I'm looking, the P I'm looking for, that's the probability corresponding to the quantile, and my sample, such that the probability that my random variable is to the left of the bound equals the P I'm actually looking for. Now, this turns out to be uh, one step too far in the simplification. What you actually need is a function where you say, okay, I take an upper bound, 
with the net trip parameter alpha such that the probability that my true quantile is smaller than that bound is equal to alpha. Now we have two probabilities. One is the p of the quantile, the other is the alpha that we get the bound right. We are, this is a kind of a confidence interval, but because we're looking at a quantile, it, it has some special characteristics. Now, obviously, I did a numerical experiment with this as well. I said, okay, let's do the same experiment. Uh, 10,000 draws of a 20-point sample. We take the samples, we run them through my BUB, which I derived for the Gumbel distribution, and let's see if the distribution we get does what we want. And before I show it, my alpha, I took my alpha to be 10%. So I said, okay, I accept that in 10% of the cases where I derive my 1% exceedance frequency, I'm willing to be wrong. Then I get this. And uh, this was, of course, what I expected because I'm a mathematician. Uh, on the other hand, I was very glad to get this because I'm also a numerical mathematician and there's a fairly large difference between what you get theoretically and what you get in practice sometimes. But we see that, yes, the true value is exceeded by my estimate of the true value in 90% of the cases. That's good news. The bad news is that, as you can see, uh, those 90% of the cases in which I exceed the quantile I'm looking for lie from about 1500 to uh, 2500 cubic meters per second. Now that sounds horrible, but actually if you look at the uncertainty in the experiment, which said, well, it's somewhere between 1250 and 2000, which is an, an uncertainty of 750 cubic meters per second, and the uncertainty uh, you get uh, with the estimate, uh, the, the, the simple bound I derived, that's between 1500 and, and 2500. So they're already fairly close, and this was just an experiment to see what I would get. You can do much better if you say, okay, yes, I'm looking at the quantile. I'm not looking at looking. I'm not looking for the parameters. I'm looking for this specific quantile, and I'm looking for upper and lower bounds on that quantile, so that I have a kind of a confidence interval for it, for it, either Bayesian or frequentist. Now, obviously. If you go to 100 years of worth of data instead of 20 years of worth of data, your life is going to get much, much easier. Because uh, the, all the extra information you get on the quantile is going to go into your bound. And then if you calculate the bound, you're still 90% certain of getting the right bound. But as you can see from the graph, the spread of your estimates is going to be just under 400 cubic meters per second. If you go back, so you go from 20, sam 20 samples to 100 samples, life, as far as uncertainty is concerned, becomes a lot easier. Now, the reason I looked at this was because I, I wanted to know in detail what was going on when we do our estimates of quantiles. And what I realized after looking at both the mathematical and the hydrological literature was, okay, there are ways to display uncertainty. Uh, for small samples, the prediction uncertainty is inevitably large, and you can find out about it by doing a numerical experiment with your distribution of choice. And finally, there are both frequentist and Bayesian techniques to actually take an unknown distribution and without knowing the parameters still get an idea of the spread of uncertainty. Thank you for your attention. So the conclusion is to maintain the observation network. Yes, the final conclusion is that in 100 years time we will be much better at predicting the future.
fact, this is a probability. And then you have another probability related to the confidence interval. Yes. Okay. That, that was correct. So with, uh, can we also say that with the Bayesian approach, we can unify the two numbers in one, two probabilities in one? I think with the Bayesian approach, uh, you would it would not so be it would not so much be a unification as that instead of in the frequentist way aiming at one probability for success of your prediction and one probability for the quantile in the Bayesian case you would get the full distribution of the quantile. One thing that I did not understand is why you involved uh, the non stationarity or stationarity, because uh, as I understood it, everything is stationary. In this derivation, everything is stationary, but obviously, and then trying to pull that through, through, the, through to the quantile, because it, it will probably be very hard to estimate the uncertainty in the parameters and to properly process that through all the operations you need to get the quantile. Okay, but again, if you assume parameters that change, they change in a manner that something is, again, uh, stationary. So you, you cannot get rid of stationarity, never. No, that's true. Yeah. Okay, um, in the uncertainty that you quantify, it, it, seems to me, it seems to me that the uncertainty in the definition of the distribution is not included. That's uh, the answer. Uh, uh, there is evidently uh, an additional uncertainty because <coughs> once you formulate an upper bound, usually the, the distribution is implicitly or explicitly inside that upper bound. And now, obviously, if you go Bayesian, you can say, yeah, but I can take different distributions with different probabilities and all take that together. And that would probably be a good idea. May I ask another question? Uh, this is a very interesting uh, subject that you mentioned. If you go Bayesian and you consider three distributions, how can you estimate the probability of each distribution to be correct? Um, in other words, how do you d define your prior? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's just as hard as defining any other prior. Okay. <laughs> other, in the Bayesian approach, uh, the value representing uh, the lower bound of the uncertainty is similar for the two sample size. If there is any special comment for that, you can go to the for the sample size of 20 and uh, the sample size of uh, 100. Yeah, th these were both yeah. frequentist. Yeah, but uh, um, you decrease the, the, the value of, uh, of uh, your uncertainty on the right, but more or less on your left is similar, around 1,500. Yeah, on, on the left, it, you, you, the, you have a 10% tail on the left, so... Uh, the, the the surface to the left doesn't shouldn't change, but its distribution does. It, oh, it, it's, but it's hard the to see. Of the yeah. 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 Yeah